I think the really good wealth managers, and it depends again, you know, like there's good CPAs and there's bad CPAs, right? There's good wealth managers and there's bad wealth managers, right? Um, I think the, the thing that the wealth managers have helped at least our firm to realize too is, is, is a portion of the advisory piece, right? Like what truly is advisory and what is a holistic approach to advisory? Welcome to the Model FA Podcast. I am your host, Patrick Brewer. Today's guest is Jody Paydar. She is a CPA and CEO, principal of New Vision CPA Group. She's also the author of The Radical CPA and uh, From Success to Significance, The Radical CPA Guide. She is uh, an accounting ambassador and bot advisor at BotKeeper. She does a lot of stuff in the artificial intelligence world, and she also is a wealth manager. Jody, thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast. I'm happy to be here. Great, great. Well, uh, you know, let's let's get started. I think th- this is going to be an interesting episode. You and I had met a number of years ago when I was considering launching a tax and accounting arm of my practice, and you gave me a lot of valuable information. And I think you were definitely one of the, you know, let's say most forward-thinking thought leaders in the cloud accounting space. And it looks like you've kind of even progressed past that into AI and bots. And, you know, you've expanded your tax and accounting practice. You've launched a wealth management division. So you've been doing a lot of stuff. Um, and I'd be curious, you know, just for the listeners, if you wouldn't mind, just maybe give us a quick overview of kind of what you're focused on, what you're doing right now, and then we can kind of dig in from there. I think a lot of the advisors uh, and others in financial services that are going to listen to this will get a lot out of kind of your thought process, kind of where you came from, um, and some of the things that you're doing today. And then we can kind of dig in and, and uh, kind of, you know, go through uh, some of the things that'll be more pertinent to the to the listeners. Yeah, so, um, you know, quick background on my firm is 13 years ago, I left an old school tax and accounting firm. um, And I joined my dad who had a small 1040 practice at the time. I built that firm to what it is today. And part of and I was an early cloud adopter, early social media adopter, um, early technology adopter. I'm always like on the bleeding edge. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Mm-hmm. No, and I say that because, you know, obviously you learn a lot when you're that first person through. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize about my firm is they think because of my social status in the industry and because of my social presence that our firm is huge. But what really what they don't realize is we've automated so much of our work that we are down to, seriously, there are four of us my partner who really runs the wealth management side, um, Maggie, my partner, Alex, who runs the accounting and tax side, and Lisa, our admin. And I really like hang in the media spotlight, right? Like I write books, I write thought leadership papers, I speak and I do those kinds of things. So I think, you know, the biggest takeaway for anyone to, to realize after they listen to the show and they realize is that technology gives you so much power today that you can be really big and really small at the same time, if that makes sense. So you don't have to have a ton of people to do some really cool stuff now. The technology has leveled the playing field completely. Um, And so that's what's really cool about my firm. And now, mind you, you know, it didn't happen overnight. There's Mm -hmm. definitely been an evolution. So it's 13 years of the making, but now um, it's pretty cool. So So as far as technology goes, how much of it is the technology that you're deploying versus, I guess, the thought process that went into creating workflows and SOPs and making sure that the staff or outsourcers were effectively trained on the systems? Like, is it really tech doing all of the heavy lifting and just pretty much handling it, you know, straight through processing? Or was there a lot of thought that went into creating the process and the collaboration systems and all the stuff necessary to deliver, you know, the end product? So I think... Um, because we've been at it for so long, we've always been adopting our processes, right? So Mm -hmm. it isn't, um, so our processes have changed significantly than an old school firm. Our processes are very different, but on the other side of it, um, none of the tech that we have created, we've built ourselves, right? So it's all third party process. It's all third party products. So we're always tweaking and, and reconnecting. And when I say reconnect, like figuring out a better way to do it so that what it happens is, is, is we don't really change in our firm, we just evolve. And I mean that by saying like, uh, it's just part of our DNA that things are gonna change and that are that we're gonna do things faster and different, which I think is one of the biggest um, setbacks for wealth managers and for 
uh, CPAs as a whole is everything has to be changed. Whereas if you build that into your DNA where you're always changing, it's just like what we do. Right. Yep. And, and I think that's really the difference of a radical firm versus um, an old school firm is that the, it's the idea of change is just happening and we're just always adapting. How many accounting firms are you, I mean, not like you don't need to give me a number or even a flat percentage or anything like that, but would you say that a lot of firms are adopting that mindset of grow, change, break things, fix them, adopt technology, adopt process, create efficiencies? Is it something that's starting to accelerate or is there still resistance to it? Like where are we at in the accounting industry as far as that's concerned? So when we first met a number of years ago, right, it was like so stagnant, right? Like I had been (laughs) like talking and talking and talking and nobody was hearing me. Um, Well, I guess they were hearing me. So now they're actually decided that they might move. So <laughs> <laughs> they're considering a move. It's 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 on so the I've list. So finally now. gotten their attention, and they just might move, but they still want a best practice. And unfortunately, there is no best practice. It's next practice, right? And it's how do we how do we help their teams really understand that there's no like you just there's there's no for sure pathway. You have to figure out the pathway as you move forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I found that the uncertainty component of that tends to cause people to you know not make decisions, you know, analysis by paralysis. And and the good thing about it is is the more changes you put in your firm, the more technology you add, not only does it replace talent, but it gives you additional capacity. And with that additional capacity, now you can make more changes. And I think that's the hardest part, right? It's like when you first start that marathon, my God, the first three walks suck, right? But then after a week, you're like, okay, like this, this 45 minute, walk is not so bad. Right. And then, you know, you build that strength and you build that stamina so that then that change is not change management. It just becomes like part of your firm. And that's where I think CPAs like they want the promised land, but I don't know if they're ready to go through the work. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they're scared of the work to get there. Yeah. It's painful. Just like anything, good analogy there with the marathons, getting into the gym and, you know, you're really sore the first couple of workouts and then you just got to build up the, the muscle memory and things. And eventually you kind of break through it, but yeah, it's tough and initially starting out. And I think in our industry, it's kind of the same thing. You know, a lot of firms have been doing s- stuff the same way for a long time, you know, charging on assets, not adopting a full service business model, incorporating tax planning, to, you know, maybe even tax preparation or accounting or virtual CFO services. And I think we're starting to see a shift towards that, let's call it, you know, multi-specialty practice, trusted advisor model. So it's, it's good to see that you've got that pretty much fully working in your practice. So when did you make the decision to add wealth management and what was kind of the driving factor behind adding that to the tax and accounting practice? So three years, well, so a number of years ago, um, I used to office with a wealth manager. So like I had always seen how wealth management had like had an impact and whatever. So it wasn't like I was it was brand new to me, but I always thought, oh, I got to find the right person to partner with. Like it wasn't like, so I was really intimidated about taking the exams and getting certified and all this stuff. So finally, um, a few years ago, we started to see our clients exit their businesses and exit our firm with us, right? So even though we had taken them from um, being their full service accounting and tax provider, they'd grown their businesses with us. We were their trusted advisor. They had a exit. They received millions of dollars and they now went to their wealth manager, wealth management and left us behind because the wealth managers were now doing taxes. Right. Yep. And so yep, I was that's like, fun. Hey, what about us? Right. What are we? <laughs> yep. So after that happens a couple of times, you're like, gee, what do I need to do here? Right. Mm-hmm. And so what was happening is, is was at this time too, we were using more technology and because we were using more technology, we had more capacity to do more. So I said, all right, I'm going to go get licensed. And I asked my um, tax preparer if she wanted to get licensed with me. And I, Um, she said, absolutely. And she, um, we both went through, you know, the classes and, uh, so we both got licensed and, um, we were with a broker dealer for a while and now we're just our, our, an RIA. But what was funny to me is now like she loves it and she loves it so much better than doing just tax review, which is interesting to me. So, um, she really became that advisor and, um, yeah, and and so the other cool thing is is because of the way we're structured now is we're fee only, right? So mm-hmm. and because we didn't have this legacy of all these assets um, that were, um, uh, we didn't have to worry about how we were going to charge for that. 
asset management, what we were going to do, we, we had a fresh slate. And so really our business model is built on fee only financial planning and assets under management are, they're welcome to bring their assets if they want to, but we don't really lead with that. And yes, we've gotten assets under management, but we really lead with, you know, a fixed fee, um, fee only financial planning and um, mm. incorporated into really the holistic view of their personal finances, which includes their tax, their, Yep. potentially a small business and their wealth, which Love has it. been fun. Are you, so for new clients, I'm assuming that you're presenting the full service offer on the front end and for, and correct me if I'm wrong. And then for old clients, are you waiting for them to have some type of an event or are you going to them proactively and saying, Hey, not sure if you have a financial advisor, wealth manager right now, but we offer that service. Like what's the process for new and current clients? Oh, so no. So since we've been licensed, we've been, um, I wouldn't say aggressively, but we've been going after our current client base. And um, last year, this is interesting too, we fired we fired 90 of our 1040s because we said, um, if you're going to work with us, you're either going to do a complete financial plan with us or we're not doing your 1040. So um, I, I think that's kind of an aggressive move, but on the other side of it is like, we want to be that partner to our clients. We don't want to just be compliance driven. Yep. And so, um, and so a, a bunch of them converted. So <laughs> um, not all of them, but a bunch of them did convert. And what I found was interesting is some of them left and came back because they figured, I guess yeah. they needed it later. So I don't know, but it's been, um, it's been interesting, but I, I think that was a bold move on our part, but on the other side of it, you can't be everything to everyone. And so for us to say, look, we're doing financial planning, we're going all in. And if you want to be part of our firm, you have to be part of it. So, Agreed. Um, you know, love it. Yeah. I mean, that's what I feel like a lot of CPAs that have introduced wealth management, they start to move in that direction once they realize that it's just better to have deeper relationships with folks versus, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts on a 1040. So totally respect that decision. Uh, how many of the clients that you brought over, would you say were working with a financial advisor, wealth manager initially, like at, you know, at that time, like, was it 50%, 10% and this was kind of a new service to them? What, what was that conversation? So, like? so the sad thing is, is all of them, Mm -hmm. um, meaning they're not getting what they need from their financial advisor, right? Yep. I mean, think about that, right? So <laughs> that that we offered them fee only. So for an additional fee, we offered them fee only financial planning, and they saw enough value in that to come to us and let their um, asset manager because that's what they see them as, not necessarily yep. a financial planner. They see them as an asset manager, take care of the assets, and then what's happened is is then the assets slowly come over, right? Because you build that trust, you help them make their plans. And all of a sudden they're like, well, why isn't my financial planner doing this? Right. And they're, and um, then they just start moving their assets. over. Nice. How much in assets, if you don't mind me asking, I mean, I could obviously look it up on Brightscope, but how much in assets have you managed to transfer from the tax and so accounting side of the business? I don't know off the top of my head because I don't like, that's not my, yeah, it's not a metric. Like, that's Maggie's wheelhouse, yep. but it's, it's amazing to me because what what happens is is like they start with a couple hundred thousand and then they and then it just keeps <laughs> yep. going right so Piles it's up. like like it's not like okay I'm quitting one financial advisor and I'm starting a new one it's okay I'm going to start working with you as I build trust whatever then they slowly move all their stuff which to me I thought was really interesting yeah, I mean, breaking up is hard in a service-based business, so it's probably, you know, the relational side of it starts slow and then eventually it come, becomes easier to, you know, rip the Band-Aid, I guess you right. could say. But that's that's great. I mean, it sounds like you've established kind of a fractional family office type of model, you know, tax accounting. Are you still doing virtual CFO services as well for business owners? Yeah, we are. So okay. we, we do that as well for small businesses. How does it work with, uh, cause you and I were chatting before we started recording on the idea of, uh, AI and automation and these things, how has that allowed you to first, how are you doing it? I guess at a high level, because four people for a tax accounting and wealth management firm is a very lean staff. So, you know, what are you automating? How are you doing it? How are you thinking about it? I think this could have broad application for, for the folks that are listening. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, first of all, all our clients are in the cloud. You have to be in the cloud to work with us. We don't we don't work the way 
I'll say small businesses want us to work. It. And when I say that, I'm meaning the small business isn't driving the way we work. We tell our small businesses how they're going to work with us, yep. right? So we have a very standardized process. We have a very standardized way we work with them. And because of that, we can scale. Um, and that means everything's in the cloud. So we're using QuickBooks Online for um, small business accounting, and we're using eMoney for financial advisory, right? Yep. So, um, so that just makes it easier to start with. Uh, then we're using, we may use a number of other apps, but then we use a service called BotKeeper. And BotKeeper um, is an AI um, uh, company that essentially um, they were they raised twenty million dollars by Google last year. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, minor, um, yeah, <laughs> just small and numbers. What, yeah, small amount, right? Um, and what they do is essentially they do all the bookkeeping. So they call it bot keeping, but essentially what it does is it does all the categorization of transactions, right? So in QuickBooks Online, and as an accountant, you would have to hit accept, 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 or you have to write the rules to accept the transactions. Well, the bots or the artificial intelligence and machine learning actually do all that. So now you only have to manage the exceptions. So the exceptions, instead of there being 400 transactions for you to look at, there may be only five, right? Wow. So it allows you to do a lot more work with less people. And what was interesting is people are all like, oh, well, you know, did you go looking for this technology? And um, well, we really didn't, but we were having a hard time filing, finding talent, right? Um, mm. As a small firm, you know, all the accountants go to really big firms and then it's hard to find people. And what we found is, is that by utilizing technology, we don't have to hire as many people, which solves our biggest pain point, which is finding people. Yeah. Um, so that's how we've really utilized them. And, and so then the bots do all the accounting and bookkeeping. Alex just has to review the file at a higher level, like an accountant would come in and review a file from a bookkeeper. And then we push right to tax. So we're almost at a zero touch tax return, if you can believe that, which is kind of scary, but it's kind of awesome, right? It's pretty crazy. Like, <laughs> so when we push to tax, the tax actually, there's AI in our tax software that goes in and um, essentially maps the account from QuickBooks Online. So um, if it knows what it is, it puts it there. If it doesn't, it says, hey, check this out, um, pick this line, and then... Um, yeah. And then you, then it pushes to tax. So yeah. So we're almost at a zero touch tax return, which is kind of crazy. It's pretty amazing. What tax software are you using that has AI embedded in it? So we're using CCH access. Okay. They yep. have a, a bridge model and they call it, uh, it's CCH financial prep. And that's the, that's the bridge that takes QuickBooks online and pushes it into tax. How are you dealing with the the data collection piece of taxes. Cause that's to me has always seemed like the bottleneck and I, I haven't really found any good solutions for that. And people are selective in how and when they send you the information. Like how do you force compliance on that and make that scalable? So I wish there was an easy, I wish there was an easy thing for that from a business side. It's very easy and that we don't allow clients to work with us who don't work with us all year long. Okay. So, so that's like, you can't come with us to us and, uh, March and just say, I want a corporate tax return done. Yeah, nope. Yeah. You're, you're either working with us all year or we're not working with you because you're like, that's not going to be my emergency in March. It's, <laughs> there's too much else going on. Um, but uh, from an individual uh, standpoint, it's hard. There's, there's no perfect way. Okay. Um, I mean, you can have portals, but at the end of the day, you spend a lot of time training your people, your clients, how to use those portals. Um, not everybody is user friendly. People send you documents via text. Via, I mean, if there's like simple, like they, yeah, I wish I had the perfect uh, solution for that, but yeah. I was just wondering if it existed. I, you know, if you did, I'd be like, oh my gosh, she's got, she's got the Holy grail. <laughs> Hey, Model FAs, I know you're enjoying this conversation, but I wanted to take a quick break to talk to you about the Model FA Accelerator. This is a unique collaboration between us and you, where we help you build a financial advising practice that you can be proud of. We focus on the foundational concepts around how to pick a niche or a specialization, how to price your services, how to construct an offer that people are going to buy, and then how to market it and sell it in a way that'll get people to sign on the dotted line and become clients of your firm, all while giving you the information to scale and set up workflows and 
operational processes that will allow you to reclaim your time and build a practice that doesn't run you. So if you'd like to hear more about that, go to www.modelfa.com forward slash accelerator or www.modelfa.com. Hover over, work with us and click on accelerator. Hope to see you in the program. What is your focus right now? So you've got you know, a four-person tax accounting wealth management firm. It sounds like you're building this for, I don't want to call it a lifestyle business, but just a more lean, profitable business that has, you know, it's very scalable, very efficient. I mean, is, are you doing that so that you can focus your time and energy on other pursuits like AI and tech and thought leadership? Or like, what's the reason for keeping it small? Yeah, so that, I mean, to me, I'm that person um I like to discover things. I'm the pioneer. I'm the one who's always pushing boundaries. But once it's operational, I'm bored out of my mind. So um, we have that in common. (laughs) Right. That's just me. (laughs) I don't know if you could tell that or not. Right. But um, we have it in common. Don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) So what I would like to um, do is I I really like the consulting that I'm doing right now and um, the social media stuff and really the movement. Right. Like the whole reason, my whole why has always been, it's not, it's never been about the tech. People always say, oh, Jody likes tech. It's never been about the tech. It's about making sure that as CPAs, you can have a good lifestyle. Now, I think wealth managers figured that out a pretty good while ago, but CPAs have always worked a bazillion hours a week during yep. tax season. And like, that's not cool. And when I left my old school firm 13 years ago, I was a young mother. And that was one of the things that I had an issue with is that, um, It didn't matter how good I did because I wasn't working all these hours. I wasn't getting recognized for my success Mm -hmm. just because I wasn't in the office, right? It was a butts and seat mentality. And so, um, so for me, the reason I'm excited about all this tech and about all this business improvement and process improvement and, you know, being able to build these firms is so that CPAs can have a life, right? So that they're not working 80 hours a week during tax season. Let the computer do that work and let us go home, right? Everyone's like, oh, well, AI is going to take our jobs. I'm like, really? I'm like, maybe you just want to go home and see your family at dinner time, right? Um, <laughs> like, why is why is um, that a bad thing to want to work nine to five or whatever? Do you know what I mean? Like, why is yeah. it or, or any time or whatever? But why why do we have to work 24-7? Yeah. So um, at the end of the day, to me, that's what it's about. It's about results and being able to have a profitable firm and not kill yourself in the process. Agreed. Yeah, no, that's a good point. In your in your in your mind, do you think that? What do you think will happen? Do you think that tech and and AI and automation and all these things will uh, make the change for the CPA, and they're just going to invent an end to end solution that just fully reconciles all the accounting, does all the taxes, and collects all the information, and just kind of cuts the accountant out of the out of the picture? Uh, or do you think that the accountant will transition and there'll be kind of these tech enabled accountants that leverage technology? I know we have that right now, but where do you think it's going to end up uh, when it's all said and done? So um, 200, over $250 million has gone into the artificial intelligence and accounting space in the last year. So that tells you like that this, like it's changing and it's changing fast, mm-hmm. right? So that VC capital is here. Um Bot keepers positioning is that they want to help accountants be the tech enabled accountants and that no one can take away that person. Right. And that um, essentially kind of like robo advisor, which you guys have kind of gone through already is a robo advisor does something. But you really need um, you really need to have um, that person there as well. Right. Yep. The human interaction. Absolutely. And so, so that's where I see it coming from or coming okay. to, I should say. Okay. Are you seeing any other uh, unique trends or is there anything about the wealth management industry that surprised you or that you've been able to, you know, take elements of and apply in your accounting and tax practice? Like based on you integrating that service into your practice, has that changed your mindset at all? Are we ahead? Are we behind? Are we, you know, in jeopardy of a similar thing going on? Like what, where, where do you stand with that as far as wealth management is concerned? Well, I think the really good wealth managers, and it depends, again, you know, like there's good CPAs and there's bad CPAs, right? There's good wealth managers and there's bad wealth managers, right? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I think the, the thing that the wealth managers have helped, at least our firm, to realize, too, is, is, is a portion of the advisory piece, right? Like what truly is advisory and what is a holistic approach to advisory? And so I think 
Um, I think that's a good thing. And I think there are lots of financial managers out there and wealth managers out there who do that well. And I think there are some that don't do it so well. But I think that's one of the things that they can help tax and accounting people with. And I think on the, going the other side is if tax and accounting people could help them understand a little bit more of the technical piece of the tax piece and of the, um, the situations, um, I think it would be good, right? And I, I think one of the biggest problems today is, is nobody owns anything. If you talk to a financial advisor who's not part of your firm, um, it seems like they always say, oh, we'll check your tax person. And if you talk to a tax person, if they're not part of your firm, they always say, oh, we'll talk to your financial advisor. But very few, there are very few relationships, I believe, between accountants and financial advisors who are not embedded together yep. that work well. Yeah, no. I mean, you and I, we had this conversation years ago. I went through the ringer trying to figure this problem out. We finally got a solution. So the the path that I took was initially calling around trying to build relationships with CPAs. You know, got the got the red light. Most of them were <laughs> more interested in that transactional work. They couldn't really differentiate between you know, a good and a bad advisor, not to say I'm a good or right. better than anyone, but just the value proposition of coordination, the expert team model, they didn't really want to participate in that. Um, and then we tried to launch our own tax and accounting services, which has its own challenges because you got to bring somebody on, you got to pay them a salary, you got to create all this infrastructure and somebody needs to manage and look over that process that's an expert. And, and for an advisor who doesn't have a background in tax and accounting, that can be pretty daunting. So, um, you know, that didn't work out well for us either uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, mostly because the person decided to just not do the work <laughs> and, <laughs> and tell us too late in the tax season. So we needed to hire somebody else in to finish it. Uh, so that was an expensive mistake. But, um, you know, over the past couple of months, we've actually finally cobbled together the model that I think works, um, you know, it's not insourced to, to the degree that you have it, where you've got everything under one brand, you know, everything is unified, but, you know, we have an office with a ta with a CPA, a business tax attorney, um, you know, and we're able to handle all of those matters related to tax accounting, VCFO, you know, and, and wealth management. So I think that's the way the industry is progressing. Um, and I'm, I think I'm hearing the same thing from you is just kind of building out that expert team insourced or outsourced, you know, hopefully insourced at some point, and then just providing better, you know, outcomes for the, for the clients and coordinating everything. Yeah, I would agree with that. Whether you're like a CPA or a CFP or whatever your designations are or how they connect, I really believe that you really have to have that holistic approach and that it has to be a coordinated holistic approach. It can't just be, oh, well, this is a financial advisor I work with. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> What, what's your advice to an advisor who wants to create that approach? I mean, I feel like advisors are at a disadvantage because, you know, we don't have the background necessarily in prep and, you know, bookkeeping and those types of things. Maybe that's not quite as much of an issue now with all the tech and automation and, I, and AI that's available. I mean, what would your advice be to me, you know, now we had this conversation four years ago and you gave me advice, but what is your advice now given the changes and now that you understand kind of the wealth management space, like what would you advise an advisor to do if they wanted to create something similar to what you and I have done? So I would say find a younger practitioner who is interested in all the tech and all that piece of it mm -hmm. and work with them on advisory skills. Because I think the one thing that um, financial advisors did right was they teach their next generation of financial advisors. And the reason they teach them is because of the way the commission structure works, right? So a lot of times if you have um, someone, um, if there's an incentive, right, to teach them how to be a financial advisor and there's a commission share on it, then guess what? That knowledge gets passed, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in CPA firms, there hasn't always been that incentive to teach the next gen, right? It's like, oh my God, I got my own work to do. Get out of my way, right? Yep. So, which yeah. isn't necessarily right, but it's just honest, right? It's reality. So, what I think is good about the financial advisory space is a lot of those conversations um, that if you can help that that detail tax. Um, expert that accountant expert learn how to have advisory conversations, then you guys can work together really well. 
because I think that's where they need a little bit more help. They need a little bit more help on the soft skills. They need a little bit mm -hmm. more help on the sales skills. Mm -hmm. They need a little bit more help um, on the relationships side of it. And then, you know, use them for the, the technical piece that you need help with. Got it. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think that's a good starting place for a lot of advisors out there that are looking to integrate these services. Um, have you noticed that in your time, are you still doing any consulting directly with uh, tax and accounting firms and, and, and do, you know, speaking, obviously doing speaking and thought leadership and, and things of that nature. Are you doing any one-to-one -one consulting or is that you kind of move past that? No, I do a little bit of one-to-one -one consulting to firms, bigger firms now mostly, but yeah. Um, because they want to get radical, right? Like they realize that they need to change and they either don't have the leadership in house or they need help. Okay. What are you advising them on changing first? Is it changing their business model to incorporate other services to increase margins? Is it to, you know, improve their offer through the better, you know, use of technology and automation? Is it everything? You're like, hey, you need to tear this thing down to the studs and like redo the whole thing. Or like, where do you start? Yeah, so um, I do an assessment of the firm first, and then, um, you know, a lot of it is customized. But, I mean, realistically, it's like it's almost if they had a blank slate, what could they do? And so that's what's interesting to me. Um, if they had a brand new blank slate, what could they do to start over? But really, we're helping them with process. We're helping them pick technologies. We're helping them with culture issues. We're helping them with training. I mean, like, whatever, like they need, they need help with. Because again, they want to get to where we are. And it's hard when you're in a bigger ship, right? Like the reason we've been able to evolve so much is because we're agile and we can move, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have to move 10 people, it's harder. You have to move 100 people or you have to move 1,000 people. It doesn't move as fast as you necessarily want it to. Very true. What have you been doing on the growth side of the equation? Are you primarily leveraging existing relationships, getting introductions and referrals? Are you doing any online or traditional forms of marketing? Like, what are you doing to grow the firm? Or is that not really a focus right now based on where it's at? So I'm lucky because of my thought leadership, my firm naturally grows, right? So because I have such a strong social, social presence, like I have a really good front door. <laughs> and when I, I say bet. that, meaning my online presence, right? We now, I have over almost 700,000 followers on LinkedIn. So leads just come into me, which is crazy. Like, I mean, like if someone would have asked me that, I'd have been like, yeah, right. But no, leads just come in. So we're doing that. And then now we just announced actually a partnership with um, uh, marketing, um, marketing by numbers.io. And what they are is they are video marketing, right? So essentially it's content, yep. but um you get to do the content in your office. So like they set you up, they send you a tripod, you put your iPhone up there, they give you all the content in a, um, uh, in a transcription thing, you know, so you're just reading it and you get to make your own videos with your own content, which is pretty freaking cool. So nice. like it's their content, but it's you like, so they give you like, the technical piece to it, but all you have to do is create the delivery and then you can email that out. And we've already seen a great success with it with like, cause it, again, it's engaging, right? People yeah. want to be engaged and nobody wants to read the email newsletter anymore. So it's like an email newsletter with a video. Have so. you noticed that most accountants like freeze up and want to like hurl themselves off a bridge if you tell them to do a video though? <laughs> so yes, but because it's like in a box and I, it's like video in a box, they yeah. get a little bit easier, right? And they can be as stiff as they want because right now it's only going to their clients who I say already know they're stiff, right? Just get started. Yeah, they, yeah. no expectation for right, being no uh, Will Smith on your camera. Clients. What are they going to do, right? Okay. And then 700,000 followers on LinkedIn. Or, I mean, what I thought you were primarily specialized in B2B. Like that's more accountants than exist, I think, in the country. How are you? Like where? where's so the So I have a lot from? of Indonesians following me as well. No, seriously. Like I'm global now, which really? is crazy. I went to Singapore this year. No and way. I did a keynote there, which was amazing. Singapore is an amazing place. If you get a, if you ever get an opportunity to go there, um, definitely um, get there. Um, but I'm not as cool as you. I have like 10 followers, so, <laughs> but they're um, really engaged. It's really all about engagement these days. <laughs> those 10. <laughs> they so, comment no, on everything. I, I think what it is, is it's just, you know, it's a long time, right? Like I've been 
I, you know, it's 13 years and 10 years on social, and it's not like this stuff happened overnight. It's It's been the same vision, the same um, passion, the same idea of change, the same um, idea of making the accounting space a better place, right? And so people connect with that, and then they share it. And, and then at, at a certain point, it's just a numbers game, right? The more numbers you have, the more likes you get, the more people follow, right? Yep, so for sure. it just becomes... Um, you know, it just becomes who I am. And I just got LinkedIn Live, which I'm pretty stoked about. So I started playing with that. So that's Ooh. pretty cool. Yeah, I don't think my account has been authorized for LinkedIn Live yet, but we'll see. Eventually, Hopefully. everybody's going to get it. I mean, it's just in beta now, but pretty soon everyone will get it. Nice. What uh, What's on the horizon for you, I guess, in 2020? Where's your Where's your head at? What's your focus? Are you just going to be kind of leaning into the, uh, you know, the bot keeper and a lot of the other engagements on the AI tech side? Or are you going to be, what, where, where do you, what do you have planned for this year? So, um, you know, the cool thing is, is I have two really great partners who manage the technical side, right? So Alex is on the accounting side, Maggie's on the wealth. So it really allows me to do what I want to do, which is going to be more media driven, more um, writing, may have another book out there, starting to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, speaking and just keeping to push and evolve, you know, uh, the radicals get getting more CPAs or wealth managers involved in getting radicalized and changing their practices because, um, because why not? Like, I mean, and the thing is, is it too, it's like you have a choice, you can change or you can not change, but if you don't change, what's going to happen. So yeah. like, you know, and, and making the choice to not change is a choice. So <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> just doesn't hurt as bad right now that's the uh, you know i right. feel we like we have a little the, bit of time to to evolve right and the thing is is it doesn't all have to happen at once it's not like you're gonna flip a switch and everything's gonna change overnight but you got to start on that path you got to start moving because if you don't you know you'll blink one day and truly the robo advisors will have taken over and and yep. i don't say that in jest it's just like if you don't evolve your skill set why wouldn't a computer do what we do? Because a lot of what we do is rote. Yep. No, I think that's uh, that's some solid perspective. I mean, outside of those words of wisdom, do you have any any other parting thoughts for advisors and others in financial services that are tuning into this? Anything that you would, uh, based on your experience um, on both sides of the table now, any, any advice that you could uh, impart on them? You know, I would just say, just keep moving. Um, and and be open and curious because like I think it's really exciting what's coming. I think the whole idea of AI and all the technology that's coming into both our spaces or the complete space is pretty cool. So just be open to it and um, don't be afraid of it and embrace it because we don't know what we don't know yet. And I guarantee what we do today is not what we're going to be doing in 10 years, but it's not that it's a bad thing. It's just going to be different. So just be open to it being different and, and then, you know, and then we'll all be relevant in the future. Cause I think that's what scares people, right? Like they're afraid, mm -hmm. but you know, like somehow we've all managed to evolve and what we're doing today is different than what people used to do in the nineties and we're still all working. So, um, we're just going to evolve with it. So that would be the only thing. Great. Well, Jody, thank you so much for your time um, and all the success that you had. It's really impressive. It's good to catch up and hopefully I'll have you back on maybe in four years and you can tell me how you have uh, 20 mil billion followers <laughs> and we can just check back for in sure. on all the robots and things that you oversee. But uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast and uh, giving our audience some words of wisdom. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you.